Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is and on behalf of everyone at Better Earth Than Dead, we are so excited to see you on Zoom to celebrate Trent Dalton's latest novel, All Our Shimmering Skies. Trent is joined tonight in conversation by Michaela Kal Kalowski. Please note that tonight's event is being recorded, so if you would not like to be filmed, please turn before we begin the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet. These will be different depending on where you're zooming in from. For me, it is the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that Better Earth Than Dead is built. Past, present and emerging and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We are joined tonight by Trent Dalton. Trent is a staff writer for the Weekend Australian magazine and a former assistant editor of the Courier Mail. He's a two-time winner of a Walkley Award for Excellence in Journalism, a four-time winner of a Kennedy Award for Excellence in New South Wales Journalism, and a four-time winner of the National News Awards Features Journalist of the Year. Since its publication in June 2018, Trent's critically acclaimed debut novel, debut novel Boy Swallows Universe, one of the most loved Australian novels of all time, breaking Nielsen Bookscan records to become Australia's fastest selling debut novel ever. Dalton's uniquely Australian voice has also been embraced by readers overseas, with rights sold to 34 English language and translation territories. It has won many major Australian literary prizes, including the UTS Glenda Adams Award for new writing at the 2019 Premier's Literary Awards, the 2019 Indie Book of the Year, New South Wales Premier's Literary Award for Choice and the Indie Book of the Year, and a record-breaking for Australian Book Industry Awards. Boy Swallows Universe is currently being adapted for the stage by Queensland Theatre Company and for the screen with Joel Edger Edgerton attached. Lucy, I'm so sorry you had to read that. It's terrible. <laughs> I'm, that's murder. Yeah, but you did you got it got a whole lot of achievements. Sorry. I'm going to like, yeah, I was just like, hey, you don't have to put that so sweet. Thank you for that amazing intro. <laughs> no worries. Um, Trent is joined in conversation tonight by Michaela Kalowski. Michaela is an interviewer, facilitator, and presenter. She's a regular interviewer, facilitator at Sydney Writers Festival, Brisbane Writers Festival, Sydney Film Festival, Sydney Jewish Writers Festival, Rose Scott Women's Writers Festival, uh, UNSW, for local libraries and for community organizations. She's also programs and conducted interviews for ABC National, Local Radio and Classic FM. Her recent interviews include Margaret Atwood, David Mitchell, Trent Dalton, Julia Baird, Michael Connolly and Tim Flannery. In June 2020, she curated ABC Radio National's first ever on-air writers festival, Big Weekend of Books. There will be a Q&A session towards the end of um, the in conversation. Please type any questions you may have for Trent into the group chat and he will answer them via video once the time comes. Without further ado, here is Michaela to kick things off. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to be here tonight in conversation with Trent Dalton. As Lucy said, my name is Michaela Kolofsky, and I am um, really excited about this conversation. What we're going to do tonight is I'll speak with Trent for about 40 minutes and we'll leave a good 15 minutes at the end for your questions. So as Lucy said, pop them in the chat box down the bottom and I promise at the end we'll get to as many as we can. I'm not going to do Trent's bio again because we've just heard it and he squirms a bit when we do his bio. That was pretty tough. That was pretty tough for you. But I would say quickly that, um, you know, that All Our Shimmering Skies was only released about a week and a half ago. And it's already, we just got the news today, it's already the number one selling book in Australia across the board. So it's a, it's a oh. very fast... <laughs> It's amazing. Colleen, I love you, Colleen. I saw I that. Thank you. It's, and it's also, I have to say, it's, you know, I know we're all pretty, you know, none of us are new, necessarily new to the whole Zoom thing anymore, but it's really lovely to see everyone mm. in the room. Mm. With... Um, tonight, in the time that we have, I want to ask Trent about where this story, and in particular, where the character of Molly Hook came from. I want to talk to him about the people he met and the stories they shared with him in the Northern Territory and how that shaped this novel, All Our Shimmering Skies. Uh, we want to talk about odysseys. We want to talk about powerful women in his life and his novels, and also what it's like to see a film adaptation of your own book happen. And also maybe Pearl Jam, if we can get to it, which I promise will make <laughs> yes. sense later on, I promise. Yes. <laughs> so we're gonna, I'm going to dive in. Um, Trent, I know most people have bought a copy of All Our Shimmering Skies or they've already read it or they're reading it. But for the people who've just picked up their copy now and we don't want to ruin it for them, can you give us the story synopsis in a nutshell, please? Oh, thank you so much. And thank you, Lucy, again. And Michaela, it's such an honour to be doing this with you. And thank you for that beautiful intro. Um, All Our Shimmering... And thank you guys for coming, by the way. It's Thursday night. You could be doing a million other things and you chose to support Australian literature. So... Thank you so much. I love you all for coming out. Um, 
Michaela, that book is called All Our Shimmering Skies. And it's the story of a 12 year old girl named Molly Hook um, in World War II Darwin. Her life is so rough, so tough that she's come to believe she's cursed. And because of the sins of the actions of her grandfather. And um, as the bombs drop over Darwin, she can't help but thinking those bombs are dropping because of her and it might be her fault. And she decides to head off and make her escape, her great quest. And she's, she's trying to find the man that she believes might remove her curse, but also she's trying to find deep down answers as to what the hell happened to her mum and where her mum went. And, uh, Along the way, she meets two really wondrous and unlikely companions named Greta and Yukio, and, um, and she's aided by four gifts that fall from the sky. The first sky gift is a map. The second sky gift is a friend. The third sky gift is a miracle. And the fourth sky gift is Molly's end and the end of her story. And um, that sort of mantra is what I had writing it, and that's what the whole story is about. And, um, yeah, it's so cool to be talking to you about it tonight. Thank you. That's awesome. I want, it's always better to hear it from the author. Um, you know, Boy Swallows Universe gave us Eli Bell, who people just loved and they still love. There's people still discovering him, you know, 18, two years, two and a half years on. Mm. I wanted to know, you know, Molly Hook, as you said, is the centre of this story. Why, why a 12-year-old girl? Why is she the tip of the arrow that, that takes us all the way through this story? Well, a year and a half ago, Michaela, probably now, um, my daughter comes home from school, my youngest daughter. She's, I've got two daughters. They're 11 and 13. And my youngest one, um, picture like a young Kyle Minogue on Ramsey Street or something, or, but only 11 version of that, 11-year-old version of that, really just like plucky and, you know, she could become a mechanic like Charlene. But, um, you know, it's uh, she came home and she's just got a lot of spunk, this kid. And she just like, oh, Dad, I had an interesting chat with my teacher um, she said she's reading that book of yours, Boy Swallows Universe. And, you know, the teacher starts telling her all about like, gee, you know, you come from an interesting family. And, uh, and that's an interesting conversation for that beautiful girl of mine to have, you know, because I'd told her all about the story of that book and how, you know, I'd sat my girls down before it all came out just for their own kind of, I didn't want any kid giving, my, giving them a hard time on the schoolyard and stuff. But I had to warn them, you know, like, I'm sorry, girls, but your old man had to write this book about his 1980s and it's all about grandma and how she fell in love with this dangerously successful heroin dealer in the 1980s. And it's all about your uncles and I and how we, how we genuinely found a secret room beneath that man's house and, um, and, you know, beneath his bedroom and inside that secret room was a red telephone. And, and I needed to write a book about um, who was on the end of that telephone. And uh, there might've been some magical things on the end of that telephone and I wrote a book about it and and somehow my daughter's teacher reads it and says but she said the coolest thing Michaela this was the cool thing about this teacher she made sure everyone in Sylvie's class knew and here's how cool teachers are you know don't even get me started on the wonders of our Australian teachers but she made it known that this is a cool book and that this is to something we can be proud of and and that um it, that sylvie can be a, be proud of and never be ashamed of it and that teacher was encouraging sylvie to own her story and where she's from and and distantly what she carries down and and all that stuff which is what all our shimmering skies is about but that afternoon so don't even get me started on that thread because i could talk for hours about that but that afternoon she comes home and she's like dad but so she's asking heaps of questions about it. She's like, dad, but you're a father of two girls and, and you wrote a book about these two beautiful boys, Eli and Gus. And she's like, but you're a father of two girls. Why don't you write a book about two beautiful girls? And um, I thought that was a darn good idea. I thought that was a brilliant idea, Michaela. And, uh, and I thought, Why, what the hell am I doing? Um, you know, I got a lot of letters from like 14 year old boys from around the world. I swear to God, you know, and, and girls, a lot of, you know, just people, young youngsters right across Australia saying thank you for showing me in that Boy Swallows Universe book that there's a light and I just need to get through the dark, but there is a light and it never goes out to quote Morrissey, but it's like it, it cannot be extinguished if you, don't, if you don't let it, you know, and you don't allow it. And, um, and I was like, well, why, why am I not writing something like that for my own daughters whose, end of, whose story I am obsessed with? You know, there's nothing more I'm interested in. So it's, it's no wonder I wrote about a 12 year old girl smack bang, but between 11 and 13. I mean, she's a complete amalgam of my two daughters and uh, yeah, uh, you know, tell me to shut up Michaela, but I, there's a, there's an added real deep part about that too. Is Please, because, go on. Like, why did I go to an adolescent and why do these a adolescents sort of form both of those books? 
well, I do believe that, you know, there's all these Australian kids out there and I've documented them. I've, I've written about them for 20 years, Michaela, and they're walking the knife edge um, of having magic bashed out of them and kicked out of them by life. And I adore those people, those young Aussie kids who carry on through that despite whatever challenges they're up against. And, and I adored that in my own self at 12, you know, and I, I love that version of myself. And I, in some ways I respect him even more than the, the 41 year old version that I've become, you know, because that kid was just pure and raw and, strong and you know life came in and made my brain all complex and good things happened and wonderful things happened but, but that kid at 12 he was just this raw being soaking up life and so what I'm trying to get at in answer to your wonderful question Michaela is it's just me again you know it's just me I tried to run from Eli Bell and I ran all the way to Darwin to these forests and these vine forest country and I found Eli Bell and Eli Bell's just me and he was sitting by a rock pool in Litchfield National Park, you know, thousands of miles away from Brisbane, as far away from Brisbane as I could get. And I found him again, you know, and, uh, and I think that's beautiful. And I think I'll be finding him for the rest of my life, you know, because yeah. that 12 year old version of me is probably me at my most emotional and most powerful too. I've probably got more to offer speaking from the perspective of that boy than I do as a 41 year old, pretty happy go lucky, um, fairly well off uh, father of two you know what I mean so I think I've got more to say using using that 12 year old boy and I think we're all very very glad about that because I think, I think there's also a thing that happens as you grow up that you sort of forget that inner voice a lot of people get disconnected from it I always think it's kind of oh. ironic that that children are raised by adults I always feel like children should be raised by children because <laughs> so many adults have forgotten what it's like to play and they've forgotten as you say we've forgotten what it's like to sort of tap into that magic and one of the things I loved about Molly is all the way through the book she's always asking questions but yeah. the truth is that there's no one in the book who asks she's digging for questions she's digging for answers sorry but she's no one in the book who asks, asks better questions than her she's oh got, wow wow she's got the guts to ask the questions that really matter and i really love that about her and i, I read it as an adult and it really resonated on that level as well well oh, isn't i mean i love that you say that that's all eli, eli bell was doing too he's kept kept on asking questions am i a good will i be a good man are you a good man that i'm talking are, are you the very man i'm talking to are you a good man and, and you're exactly right i mean you've just captured the whole theme of that whole book all our shimmering skies michaela like she kept she's going on the quest yeah to, to find people who, will, that who exactly to find yeah. the people that will give the answers and she gets the final most wonderful answer from the man she did go to meet long coat bob i won't spoil it but you know she, yeah. he, all he has to say is hey look that you've got the answers kid. Cause you've been asking the beautiful questions like that. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. Like that. You've just nailed the whole story, <laughs> man. Like, but let's, let's, let's keep yeah. talking about the structure because there's so much that I want to talk to you about mm. in, in mm. the book as well as a few other bits and pieces. The, when I was trying to find a word to describe Molly's, you know, I don't like the word journey has kind of been co-opted. It's like, she's not, Molly doesn't have a journey and it's not really a treasure hunt. It's a new set mm. to me before we, before tonight, it's an odyssey. She's on an yeah. odyssey. And I wondered yeah. if you could talk a bit for people who are reading the book at the moment about whether other literary or other kinds of odyssey ideas inform how they informed your writing all our shimmering skies. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I'm, I'm um, the, yeah, like, I, again, I really did want to get away from the grit of prison and drug dealing and, and all of that, but you know, so whilst thematically I'm, I'm playing in the same water because I think thematically that's what I'm here to do. You know, what makes a good man, what constitutes a good human being, um, can our legacies affect us? What, what, do, what do young people do with the trauma and the rocks that they carry around in their duffel bags? Um, but at the same time, I was also going, I really want to just write a quest, a rollicking adventure that I sneak in morality and all sorts of decency and all these other massive questions. But, but all I wanted to do, Michaela, was I wanted to write something with riddles and mystery and adventure and quest and challenge and obstacle after obstacle after obstacle that our hero, hero has to overcome because, right, this is the book that Eli Bell would have been reading in the heart of the thick of the madness. This was the book that he goes back in his little bedroom in housing commission, Brackenridge. This is the book that he's reading. You know, this is the book that he picks up to escape. And I was escaping myself and escaping the crazy world of Boyce Fuller's universe, not just, the book itself, but what it was doing, like what it was, it was freaking me out. Like it was going around the world and I was getting letters from kids in Russia 
um, kids who speak he- Hebrew, a um, wow. uh, 14-year-old boy in Korea, uh, and they're telling me the deepest stuff about their lives. And it's so touching and so beautiful, the connection of that. And he's, you know, I remember this 14-year-old boy saying, hey, mate, like, we have nothing seemingly on paper to do with each other, but I can't believe how much that you told my life story, even though it's set in Dara, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, <laughs> to connect to that boy. And, but that's heavy, you know, that's really heavy stuff. And I just went, all right, I need to get away from this for a bit, you know, cause you can get, you can get lost in a lot of deep conversations. And I did, you know, for two years and, and I thought, no, I need to just breathe a bit and, and go see some of this country too. And, and as fate would have it for my day job as a journalist, I found myself, I got sent to the Flinders Ranges to walk the Flinders Ranges. I went to Uluru to sleep in a swag under the stars at Uluru. I went to Groot Island um, on, the, on the edge of Arnhem Land. And then I went to Litchfield National Park, this place I've been many times in, you know, south of Darwin that I adore. And I'm, you know, well, you know, I could talk forever about that, but uh, I tell you, but all of that was shaping this sense of odyssey, this sense of I'm going on an internal journey myself, but I'm, I'm actually going on a pretty big odyssey myself from the south of the country to the north. And it was just wonderful. And, and, you know, Homer's odyssey for me is groundbreaking. And, you know, the Dalton boys, Michaela, like when all that crazy drug stuff was happening, us boys were really, whilst I paint it, you know, it's dark and it's crazy and a bit sort of strange at the time. It's also wondrous and fun and joyous because us boys are just, cutting out cardboard swords and cardboard shields and we're pretending to be Odysseus and we're just pretending to be, you know, or we're in clash of the Titans and we're trying not to look at Medusa's face. And, you know, I mean, I'm talking deep cut kind of storytelling DNA stuff that's in my blood. And I thought I need to access some of that cool stuff as well. And, and you do that so beautifully. In this book. I mean, I, I don't want to <laughs> ruin people, but there's, you know, there's yeah. a kind of a cyclops, there's, there's locust eating, there's, oh, there's, exactly. Yeah, there's all yeah. these beautiful references to the yeah. to Homer's Odyssey. Yep. I'm going to, yep. I want to come back to, to love and hate, but I want to ask you, cause you just spoke about it then about landscape because mm. for me, I thought one of the strongest parts of this book was how beautifully you write about the Australian land, how beautifully yeah. you describe the, unbelievable insect life, the birds that are yeah. so colorful or so clever at hiding and the yeah. extraordinary um, plant life and, and, and other kind of flora, like, you know, the, the seeds that can kill you in an instant and the things that can sustain you in the middle of the desert and in the middle of the bush. But I wondered if you, you mentioned that you went to Groot Island and you've met people, but I wondered if you could talk a bit about you, the people you met that helped you spend time with to write about places. I mean, they're beautifully in the I mean, they're real. And I'm, mm. you know, I'm assumed you might have had, might have had to get permission to, to write about them. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, there was some incredible moments in that Odyssey that I'm talking about. And it's just me just, you know, by chance, but I actively wanted to, for example, go to Groot Island to chase up that story that I'd read about this disease called Mercado Joseph disease that affects a cluster of our First Nations people on that island. And I just wanted to find more at, about it and, and ask the questions, you know, and, and I've, just as I've done, and I, you know, I tread these, you know, into that area of Indigenous Australia extremely delicately and with utter respect. And just, but just like I've always done whenever I've written about any story relating to Indigenous affairs, you know, you call up and you just, you've got to come to it with great um, curiosity and awe. You know what I mean? You've just got to come asking a million questions and hello, you don't know me, but I'm a douchebag white guy from Brisbane. I don't think you are, but okay. Well, thank you. But you know, in, in this area you do, and you've got to be the humble sort of dude who's just going, please tell me about this world because I have no idea. And I'm, and I just want you to, to feed me that stuff as much as I can. And I'll be, I'll just listen, man. I'll just, I'll just listen. And, and I spent a week on Groot and invited by the amazing people at MJD, the Mercado Joseph disease foundation. Now Mercado Joseph disease is this neurodegenerative disease that affects your, your body and your kind of muscle movements. And, but it kind of leaves you, your brain kind of functioning and, and you can kind of realize the kind of the toughness of your very situation. And, on that island, which I'm telling you, Michaela, is as magical as anything I've written in that book, right? It's filled with 
the most wondrous trees, the most wondrous creeks, and, and it's filled with magic. And, but in the heart of that place, I met a man named Steve Buckala Waramara. And um, that man in the heart of that wilderness started telling me about how he believes, and this is, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm loath to speak for this guy because he can tell his own story brilliantly, but um, I'll briefly brush against it the same way I try to briefly brush against it in the book, but of any of this sort of stuff in the book, but he started telling me and it was putting a shiver down my spine when he started telling me about how um, he's using bush medicine and bush essentially the, you know, what you might, he might look at as magic, uh, you know, a sort of a sense of, but using the land and the wonders of that place and turning it into magic. And, and, and he's using the, the bush stuff and the bush knowledge passed down to him from his grandfather and his parents passed down to him. And he's sending these specimens and things that he's finding on that Island. He's sending them to our Sydney scientists down in Sydney. And they're trying to find a cure for the disease that is currently kind of tearing away at him, you know, and, and I, and I was profoundly moved by that. And, and, you know, it was on that Island that this word curse and, and these things, they use that word because it's, and it's not, that's not a f sort of unfamiliar term up, up in the top end. And uh, this idea that we are, but the legacy of the people who came before us. And, um, and he would tell you and people on group will tell you, and the MJD people will tell you that there is a common thread that runs through that place where some believe that the, the disease that they've been inflicted with is, partly due to the sins of people, you know, who came before them. And that's right. a very tricky area for me even to talk about, but that is, you know, and, and, and indeed it's something that I had to run past MJD and to get even permission to write an acknowledgement to Steve in the back of that book, which is kind of saying, Hey, you completely inspired me. And he just not, not even like, it's not really a lot of that is in that book at all, but Steve inspired me just to write a, with wonder and magic about that land. And I'm forever grateful to that guy. And, uh, and there's so much of Steve's charisma and kind of wonder that got into a character. I love Sam Greenway. I love him up, too. Sam. I mean, I love Sam. He's so He's cool. He's so great. And, so great. And, uh, and, and then, so that, so there's Steve and then the next sort of big kind of inspiration on that side. Okay. So you learn all that and you get even further inspired and, but I still don't know enough. All right. Now I, I've got this sky gifts. I've got these four sky gifts and I know Molly's journey and I want to take her on this quest and I want to make sure she goes to some really interesting places. And, uh, and I've loved this place called Litchfield national park. I believe it's absolutely Australia's natural landscape, best kept secret, you know, and it's only an hour and a half South of Darwin, but it is filled with like waterfalls and uh, Hitchcockian cliff tops where I see and I just go, well, things have to reach a climax somewhere near here at least. And there's treacherous holes and there's crocodiles and there's the most, you know, amazing prehistoric landscape. And it's completely wondrous to me. So I get on Google like a journal, like I sort of just, you know, just start, you know, start slow and just Google Litchfield national park. And I find a woman named Tess Addy and she is, as connected to Litchfield National Park as one could be through her family and her ancestry. And she runs a place called Northern Territory Indigenous Tours. And, and I just phoned Tess up again and just question, question, question. Hey, Tess, you don't know me. My name's Trent Dalton. Um, I've written a book about sky gifts and a girl who talks to the sky and she goes on the most amazing quest. And I wanted to walk through in my book sort of a fictionalized version of that place I love called Litchfield National Park. And she gave me the greatest honor after I explained where I was going with it. And even that she didn't laugh at the fact that the kid talks to the sky. She gave a response that sort of almost suggested something along the lines of, well, who doesn't? And, um, and that was really encouraging. And, um, and then she said, come on up, I'll show you where she goes. And it was like a groundbreaking moment in the whole sort of book because the trip I then made with, Tess and her amazing partner, Greg was groundbreaking to me. And she, 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 she so nothing sort of completely direct, but just showed me how to soak up that place with all five senses. And that, that's a great gift. All writers must write with five senses. And so those things were very deeply profound to me, those sort of interactions. And I owe Tess so much. And, you know, the cool part about that is like just on Saturday, you know, whole of Friday, Saturday, Sunday, last 
you know, back up in Darwin and we had the big launch up there and I got to sort of phone test up and like, man, you have to be front and center. And I'm just there just going, everybody, this woman is the reason this thing exists. And, and she's such a huge part of this and she's so cool. She just comes along and I'm just like, man, you know, and I'm not, I'm not sort of her. And I, I know I'm sort of trying to, I don't, I'm not trying to sell her to her or anything, but I was just telling people on that night, just please go on it because she will show you a way to see this country as if you're seeing it with fresh eyes for the first time. And that's and what I, you're talking about. These, you got to look at this country of ours as if you haven't seen it before. And that's really beautiful when you do. And I think that was the big takeaway in the book is that it's a different conception of land. And you, you gave us readers a chance to think about that. Yeah. Oh, well, that was the beauty of writing it through also the eyes of this. Oh, I, I don't want to sort of spoil it, but you know, one of the great companions she meets is a fallen Japanese fighter pilot who keeps, he's landed in the NT and he doesn't know whether it's heaven or it's, um, or it's Australia, you know, and I, and I love the way Yukio goes through and keeps picking up stick insects and looking at the underneath of them and yeah. seeing rainbows or he, you know, he sees a rhinoceros beetle, he sticks his hand in a tree full of honey and, you know, it, it is amazing. It's utterly amazing. You imagine this country if you landed from Mars and you had not seen just your backyard, you know, there'd be enough wonders in there to last you a week to stare at in wonder. And I just think Very it's really true. important for us to sometimes look at the world that way. Very true. In the book, you write beautifully about love in all its forms, but you also write about the way that, that love can turn to hate really quickly. And I wondered if oh. you could reflect a bit on do you have a sense of how fine that line is and how does that happen to people? You know, I'm thinking about uncle Aubrey in particular, Molly's yeah. uncle. Oh, Michaela, I'm so glad you asked about uncle Aubrey. He's such a complex character and he's so personal to me and, and it wouldn't seem as though on, you know, on face value. And I had a picture of Daniel day Lewis from uh, there will be blood basically. And That's Gangs exactly of New who York I saw. As well. Yeah. That's well, I'm, I saw. Oh, are you serious? That is serious. amazing. That is well, that's who that, he is. That I blank, mean, blank, but dark. So yeah, that, dark. that blank, dark menace that comes from, you can tell, I mean, it's never even explained in There Will Be Blood what made that man so horrible. And it's greed. Greed is a massive theme in this book as well. But you can tell that a lot of that character in, that, in Daniel Day-Lewis's character has, has had love gone wrong and, uh, and, and has, has messed it up or lost it or ruined it and through his greed. And, uh, but the really interesting thing about Aubrey is that he's absolutely a manifestation of a lot of Australian men that I have known. And I have either, I've also interviewed and I've rubbed shoulders with, and I'm f permanently fascinated with, um, the ways in which men so quickly go from utter devotion and true love for a woman to hate and, um, anger and even the next extension violence. And, and I, you know, we have a epidemic still in this country that I've written loads about in my journalism, but you know, I've just seen that so many times. It's so many times that story of a man's love turning to something so dark that it, it, it's beyond comprehension. And, um, and people say to me, they read this book, like, man, that guy's so dark and some dark things. And I can't shy away from it, Michaela. Like, it's just the stuff I know. I know those, I know those, living rooms at midnight that Molly knows and those half drunk liquor bottles and the swinging light bulbs and the holes in the wall. And it's just Australia, man. It's like we have, it is beautiful and it is every place that I'm talking about the landscape and the sun shines so bright here and our sky is prettier than any sky in the world, but we have a lot of darkness behind closed doors and, and I can't shy away from it. And so people go, man, that girl has to go through such hell to get to the light, you know? Well, okay, well, that's the story of so many Australian women, you know, and, and uh, who have to be so strong for their kids. And, you know, I've seen that too. And, um, and um, yeah, so, so there's no, uh, it's, it all stems from this. And I, and I sat, even as a youngster, I was well, sort of smart enough to realise like, but hang on, you, you said before hundreds of people, or you said before God that you love, you would freaking worship this woman for the rest of your life. And why aren't you? Because she's amazing, you know, and, uh, and that has always puzzled me. And, and that's the story of Aubrey Hook. You know, it's, it's, um, he loses, I don't, again, don't want to give anything away, but he's, he's, his love has turned to hate so much that his hate is sustaining him on this quest. And, and, and what if hate is that strong that it can even sustain you through death? And, um, and that's, he's a machine. He becomes this machine of hate. And, and I found that really, um, really interesting 
um, financially sim- financial simplicity says yeah. she saw. Ben uh, Lewis too. I wow, thank I you so much. Yeah. We're all on the same page. We're all on the same page. But it's a testament to your writing that you 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 strike a balance both structurally in the plot, but also about how you've described Aubrey. That we yeah we stay with him and we stay with Molly. I mean, I wanted a lot oh. of vengeance on Aubrey. I really- <laughs> you do, don't you? You really want him to get his. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. There's, before we move on, there's a lot in the book as well about the power of inheritance. Yeah. The things yeah. we inherit from family, the things we yeah. inherit from our country. Um, what got you thinking about all of that? Oh, Michaela, that's a great question. I um, Inheritance is something that's really big in my world, right? It's like, okay, well, what is a curse, right? Okay, well, well, here's a curse. The fact that I love liquor and booze like it's like the fact that i'm on a knife edge like you know at any time i could probably easily just go drinking you know what i mean and that's in my blood you know and so is that is that a curse like is that you know one way of looking at that could be like am i cursed by that but here's a blessing you know um sense of humor and and sense of kindness and all the wonderful things that was also passed down by blood to me and um and I'm very fascinated with the things we inherit and what we do with them, you know, and, uh, and, oh man, I mean, Boyce Wallace universe was all about that. And the kid's terrified of what he's about to inherit, what he's inherited through blood. Does he have the badness in him or is he, or is his goodness going to overwhelm that and, and he'll survive and live a good life. And Molly's the same, you know, she's from these horrific people and even her granddad who possibly caused this, this whole thing, this cascade of events, it, it's, it's all DNA and it's all blood and it's coming down to her and she calls it a curse and she's manifested this idea of a curse built largely in part by the myths and the the lies of people around her. But also she can't help but believe it because she's seen this thing happening in front of her and she can't begin to think it's just um, the mistakes of people. She's starting to think she has to think something deeper about it, that it's concerning magic and so forth. But you know, in reality, we all think these things like, how can this be? But we have to, we have to at some point just own what we're given anyway. Right. So, um, so here's the thing about, you know, the, this sort of thing that long coat Bob keeps telling people, and it's the most beautiful thing he has to say to anyone is carry all you own and own all you carry, which is own your mistakes and own your missteps and own every fault that is inside you. And if you do that, then you get to own all the good parts about you and all the, all the, all the right things you did. And, and, and those things can carry you forth into the future. And, and, you know, that the book is all about that. And it's my little subtle way of saying, Hey, we can also do this as a nation and we can accept our past and we can carry it with us and we can own it and we can swallow it. Like Eli says, swallow the universe. You know, the, the bad, the bad bits are also the, can be turned into your good bits and, and your, your destruction doesn't have to be, you know, it can be your creation as well. And, uh, you know, so it's sort of all of these mix of things that all comes from inheritance. And, uh, and I love that that's this massive theme in that book. And, you know, this, this, you know, Molly is asking that question, like, what is inside me? What have I been given? And is it something more than just this curse? And, uh, and was it this inheritance that, took my mum away, you know, and, uh, and, you know, so what do, what do our parents do with that inheritance, inheritance as well? But I mean, this goes even so deeper. It's like, okay, we inherit wars and we inherit as a country, we inherit the after effects of something like that. And so we inherit a generation of men who were poorly raised by dads who were dealing with their own baggage from wars and, and those dads, are now with the dads of dads like me and what do I do with that? And can I be the circuit breaker? And, you know, that's all my books are about all these big, deep things. And so, you know, I love this idea that these kids are trying to circuit break and they're trying to change their fate and change the story that they've been handed. Mm. Yeah, you write beautifully about Molly, who's got a whole life ahead of her, but you also write very powerfully about Greta, who's an adult in the book. And I, yeah. would, I loved her very much. She, I feel like she exists out there. I feel like she's real for me, for, for I think for a lot of readers. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about whether she just came to you fully formed or whether she's inspired or the infusion of other people mm. that you've known, mm. other women you've known. <laughs> oh, Michaela, I love your questions. Thank you so much for your really thoughtful, beautiful questions. Um, Greta is the product of me sitting around tables, kitchen tables in Brackenridge Housing Commission, Brisbane, and, um, and looking at mums 
both mums that I know intimately and very well, but, but I mean, what I'm saying is closely and, but also mums of my mates. And I just remember particular times where you'd wake up and you'd slept over your mate's house after, you know, you'd gone out on a, at a party and you hadn't realized what had happened at that house the night before. And you wake up and you're inside a kitchen table and that, that mum's reaching for a packet of Winfield Blue and, and, and you actually for the first time see that she's put some concealer over her eye and, and, you know, and you realise that some dark shit has gone down in that kitchen the night before, but we're all glossing over it and pretending like it didn't happen. Well, there's something beautiful about that mum as well, though, as, as sad as that is. What a freaking woman, you know, what a strong woman to freaking just carry through for her children, you know, and, and so, so as much as, I had pictures of um, Jean Harlow and Kate Hepburn and all these amazing 1930s MGM starlets um, in my head and on my mood wall when I was writing the character of Greta and even 1985 Madonna, badass, take no prisoners, 1985, the world will not bring this woman down, Madonna from 1985, desperately seeking Susan type period, you know, with the, yeah. the yeah. hair thing blowing her hair. And just Maybe like a Papa Don't Preach as well, I'm thinking. Hey, mate, pup. Michaela, don't even get me started. Papa Don't yeah. Preach is just spoke the story. It just connected. And I just love that woman so much. And, uh, but, um, but as well, I had the, these mums from Brackenridge in there. Absolutely. And Greta is that, that amazing Australian woman who powers through and doesn't realize um, just how strong she is and how absolutely bright and intelligent and incredible she is. And I love that in this book, Greta does the heroics you know Greta is the one who does the cool shit and um and I just I'm very proud of her because in my life it was the Brackenridge mums who did the cool shit too you know and uh so I was, I was really paying tribute to that inside you know this this blonde bombshell of a of a woman who's walking through that Australian wilderness going where the hell am I and give me a gin you know give me a smoke and give me a gin to get me away from here but I love I love any story where two people and three in, in this case are walking through a place looking to get somewhere and not realizing that, you know, all the things they need are, are really right beside them. This book, as we know, is, you know, it's well out into the world now. And I wondered if I could ask you a, a meta question, which is the, what's the relationship like for you between what you write and how the rest of us read and interpret it? Is it weird for you to have us tell you what it is? Oh, far out. No, Michaela, it's amazing. It's amazing. And you don't, you don't realize what you've done until someone reads it and absorbs it. Oh, I had, a, I had an amazing woman read it like two days ago. Right. And she goes, I've got it. I've got it. Um, and I don't want to spoil anything, but she goes, um, uh, Molly's Dorothy, um, Bert, the shovel is Toto. Um, and she just went on and on. Yukio is the tin man. Um, and it went on and on Michaela and I was just going, Oh my God, like there is so much wizard of Oz in that story, but it was sub, it was unconscious, right? It was just like, I love that. Who doesn't love that story? But, um, there's a silver road, there's a yellow brick road. You know what I mean? Um, there's, there's so many moments wow. and she's got these symbols and, and this, this woman, this brilliant woman had, had crafted the, who, who the wicked witch of the East was and who the wicked witch of the West was. And I mean, I urge you guys read it and find out for yourself, but you know, you know what I mean? This is the meta side of it. You go, I, I mean, storytelling is in my DNA and that sort of stuff is just obviously going to manifest. It's going to come out, but it's like, I love when a reader comes and says, Hey, by the way, um, this is what it is. This is what I think it is. And it, it illuminates me. And I go, thank you for showing me. Like, I didn't know what boys, like I tell you all those things that I'm thinking boys swallows universe is now. And that it means all these things, hope. And, but I didn't necessarily know that in the writing of it. I had to have that 14 year old boy from Korea tell me that, you know what I mean? And I, and then I start to believe it. And, and I really do, which is why if you see me anytime, I'm sorry for my sickening kind of over the top reactions when someone says something nice about it, but I'm so grateful because just the investment of time in a book is such a general generous thing anyway, but, but you want to know what they think about it and how they feel about it and what, the, what, what I did, like, what did I do? What, what do you think I did? You know what I mean? I'm sort of going like, I'm going, thank you for showing me what I did, you know? And because I don't know, I'm just throwing my heart and soul and coughing it up again and jamming it inside a book again but I need you to tell me what it's about, you know? And so I'm very grateful when someone does. Thank you. Um, I think it's maybe a dream for some authors to see their books turned into a film. And for you, it's, it's another reality. 
How involved were you in choosing who adapted Boy Swallows Universe? And, um, and why was Joel Edgerton the right person? <laughs> yeah, I, I was, you know, the, the, the team at HarperCollins were amazing. Like, because you've got to understand, Michaela, I signed my life away on that book. Like, I, I signed a contract for that book that was, like, pretty, you know, pretty low and it was pretty sort of, but because I was just so grateful to, um, to have, to be a part of it, you know, like, it was like, it was like, yeah, man, you're going to publish this really wild, ambitious book. Like, it's like, okay, yeah, where do I sign? And, and, uh, but that said, so, and including signing away, like any film writer, like as if anyone's going to make a movie about this, but, um, you know, Harper Collins have been amazing with like keeping me in the loop on, you know, I got to make the call and I got to kind of do a lot of things with that. And I'm extremely grateful to them for that. And, uh, and, you know, there was a time when my wife and I, Michaela would have the craziest discussions where, right. Um, Brad Pitt was, it was, was, was mentioned. Um, Margot Robbie was mentioned and we're having the, you got to understand suburban Brisbane, you know, we're cooking steak and three veg and then, and then fee, my wife's just going, yeah, I think Brad Pitt would be really good. Really good. You know, just ridiculous, ridiculous conversations. And because his production company was in the picture briefly, you know, briefly. And uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of discussion. And then, and then eventually, you know, it was like, forgive me if I sound like a knob, but there was, there was a bit of a, what they call, you know, a bidding war. And, uh, and <laughs> I feel embarrassed and sick even saying that, but it's true. And it was really funny and fun. And, uh, and it came down to like, Trent, you've got to go down to Sydney and have this catch up with this guy, Joel Edgerton, who I love and, you know, really admire and have a kind of man crush on. And, uh, and, and we go down to, to Sydney, but the, the people, you know, behind it all, they're just saying, Trent, you've got to be poker face. Don't be your gushy sort of like ramble off at the mouth kind of guy. You've got to be like Clint Eastwood and just like, man, you got to really just be strong. Don't, don't give anything away. We, we're not sure whether we're going to go with Joel at all. All right. So we're going to come back and we're going to play it properly. And, uh, and then this guy dazzles me with two hours of the most amazing conversation about Hollywood and you know, stuff. And, and he knew that book so well. And he just pulls out his pictures of his old sky blue Holden Kingswood and says, this is what the Edgerton boys grew up in. I'm like, man, that's the car from my book. And his favorite rugby league team was Parramatta Eels. And his favorite player was Ray Price. And, and you know, his name's Joel, my eldest brother's name's Joel. And, and then the guy says, um, two hours go by, he's telling me all about Spielberg and all this wisdom that Spielberg, it was just amazing. That guy's the most charismatic man around, right. And beautiful human being. And, and then he goes, um, he goes, we head off. He's the coolest looking guy. And he goes, uh, uh, you need a lift to the airport? And, I, and that, Michaela, I just went, you're the nicest guy ever. And I said, um, it's yours, mate. The book's yours. It's <laughs> yours. And uh, I just <laughs> caved, poker face gone. I was like, man, you have it. You want, you want it? It's yours. And it was really funny. And then, then they got, I got back a week later. There were all these phone calls from this agent in London. She's like, Trent, what's going on? Every, um, Joel, Joel Edg Edgerton's people have just assumed that they've got the book. And I'm like, oh, well, sorry. Just, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, my Clint Eastwood just ran to water. So um, yeah, but it's wild. It's wild. It's like, it's crazy. And then the funniest thing about that, Michaela, is there's been these big high up, powerful movie type creatives come out to my little hood out at Dara and, uh, and they're doing the thing with the camera, like going, Mm, taking notes about oh that shot will work and it's just <laughs> real. you've got to understand like i've lived on this street and they're going suddenly oh that will film well and people will love the look of that it's just surreal it's it's yeah it's crazy fantastic i'm going to remind everyone who's with us tonight if you've got a question for trent i'd be awesome if you'd pop it into the chat box and i will get we're going to turn to your questions really soon i can see there are already some great ones there but i'd have one or two a few, a few more for trent before we get to them trent both in boy swallows universe and in the new book you acknowledge edward louis severson the third <laughs> also known to people as eddie vedder and oh, it's, wow. it's two questions one is mm. why did why is he why is he as a songwriter, somebody who you admire and acknowledge, what does his yeah. work give to you? But also wonder, do songs creep into how you write? Do they, have they informed the structure of how you write? Cause a lot of passengers, passages in this book read like songs. They're really these powerful little, like perfect little nuggets. So I wonder oh, if you could Michaela, talk about that. Thank you. That's so cool. And you know, the, the, the rhythm and the acceleration in, in some of my writing is very song-like. You're right. And it's, and it's poetry-like. Like, that, to be honest, you know, I, I, I really like Walt Whitman's writing probably more than a lot of novelists. You know what I mean? Like, I like, I like 
I just like that. And, and if p- people read, and that's why people read Boy Swallow's Universe, and they'll read this the same. Like, I, mean, I don't know if this language or the rhythm is, is, is me. And that's fine, you know, and, um, and I'm always sort of saying that. And it's just, but it's just that poetic use of language where you're throwing your heart and soul into the words, literally physically crying on the keyboard. And the quickest way you can get that down is the accelerated use of poetry, you know, and, and, and short sentences and power and just running with it and just infusing those words with your heart and soul and hoping that the reader on the other end will go far out, man, that guy felt that bit. And, uh, and you know, who does that all the time? My man, Eddie Vedder, you know, he did that when I was 13 years of age and, and you gotta understand Michaela, like hardcore, times Brackenridge housing commission. And uh, I know you understand, I know you understand in terms of the power of that guy, but, uh, but man, you know, that, that guy's music sort of got me through high school, like no flipping doubt about it, no doubt about it. And, and I thank him in the back of those pages, not just for his inspiration, but like that guy shared his soul, like, like, and I know he came across as over the top and a bit cheesy sometimes, but I'm telling you, man, he, he, he just, I mean, I'd have dreams about that guy. It's weird. Like I'd be sitting, honestly, he was like a weird symbolic in my dreams as a kid. Like, this is true. This is, I have never told anyone this and I'm telling it to like however many people over Zoom, but he would come to me in a dream just when I needed it and would be often sitting by a pool without, because, and I know why this is the case, because in the first feature article I ever read about him, he, the journal finds him sitting on this edge of a sort of a pool that sort of type scenario. And there's people walking by going, Eddie, Eddie. And uh, in my dreams as a kid, he would come and tell me things are okay. I oh, know that's so embarrassing, but it's so great. It's isn't so it? great. I know. And it's yeah. like, you know, this life you can have in your dreams. And, and I swear, Michaela, like he's, he's come back when I became a dad and it's weird, man. Don't even get me started about my connection to that guy. And, it, and to the point where <laughs> you can convince yourself you're, flip and know the guy or something it's weird and 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 but but it's but i know he's just a man he could have been a crow you know it could have been a tiger visiting me in my dreams but he just comes in the person of eddie vetter to tell me to stop worrying move on don't fret so much about it it's all good i'm gonna write you another album it'll be fine just and, for you. Uh, i mean it goes deep <laughs> my connection to that guy and so the least i can do is say a little thank you in my book because man they, they exist because of that guy, I swear to God. And, and he's the first guy to show me, um, own your story, own your story. Like the song alive is him owning his story. Exactly. You know? It's like, right. You know that. And it's like, it's like him going, I have this weird messed up situation with who was my dad and, and what my mum was and what was happening then. And I never wrote about it, but now I'm going to write about it. I'm going to put it in a song and I'm going to give it to the world and it's going to mess me up. Right. It's going to mess him up. And, uh, but he knows even now the power of that is so much more important than, than his, him keeping that rock inside him. He was the first one to tell me Molly carries around a rock. She believes is her mum's stone heart. And, and that's just a metaphor for me carrying rocks around. And Eddie was the first one to say, man, throw your rocks elsewhere and, and, and share them with people. And, and we'll all show the world that it's not a single rock. It's a quarry there's a quarry of rocks and we've all got our rocks and we can, we can share them, you know, and and he's the one who showed me that first. And I was very, very grateful always to him. Thank you for that. It's a good moment. I'm going to jump to some questions. Um, We were talking about, you know, musical influences. There's a great question here. He says, I wonder who your literary influences are. You know, obviously you have a unique Uh, style and the Um, themes are very personal, but are there any authors whose work you can see in it because of your book? Yeah. I mean, you know, you'll read, there's so much Cormac McCarthy in this one. I mean, it's sort of, I had to hold my back, uh, hold back from delving into my sort of inner kind of McCarthy adoration and go, Oh man, to the point where Michaela, I'd write little passages and go, Oh, you freaking McCarthy tryhard, stop. (laughs) Some of that Aubrey stuff and some of that stuff he's talking about, about the, um, about life and what God deems, um, worthy and, uh, what, uh, uh, some of that notion that God kind of is only here for the birth and, and he, and sometimes doesn't want to stick around for the death and, uh, and all that stuff I find very interesting. And, um, and uh, that's all, that's all McCarthy type conversation of me reading too many Cormac McCarthy books. 
Um, Geraldine Brooks was a massive influence on this book. I had a, I had a, I had a quote from Geraldine Brooks, Brooks that she wrote about Year of Wonders, that incredible book that my late dad, who's not with us anymore, passed down to me. He flippin' loved Geraldine Brooks. And I've got a serious, highly respectful, distant crush um, on Geraldine Brooks to this day. And uh, um, she, she had a quote from around the writing of Year of Wonders, which is so poignant a book especially in 2020. It's about a woman who's a widow and trying to find life inside a village doomed by the plague. Like she's about to die and everyone she knows is about to die, but she finds so much life. And, um, and, uh, and Geraldine wrote that book. Her inspiration was walking graveyards in Europe and she would make the epitaphs come alive and, uh, and, and she'd form characters and stories from those beautiful epitaphs. And so you'll, you'll, if you read all our shimmering skies, you'll see Molly's just doing the same thing. And she's just going around making these stories and all those people inspire her. And that's her kind of faith. She has faith in these dead people and the things that are written on those epitaphs. Cause those things on an epitaph are so beautiful. And, um, and yeah. I love them so much. Right. And, uh, and, and, um, and it was, so I had this quote from Geraldine Brooks that she said in maybe in the wake of writing it and she just said it to some newspaper person or something. And it said, um, don't be afraid to see dead people. And you know, what that means for me is man, my old man, Noel, who loved nothing more than reading books. He died in the Genesis of, um, of Boy Swallows universe when I was coming up with the story and, uh, and he's in that book. He's Robert Bell. Absolutely. And, um, and he's the guy who smokes the cigarettes and reads books and does nothing but read well, he never got to read his youngest son's book, you know, and it's the greatest tragedy of one of the greatest tragedies in my whole journey through this, this literary world. And, uh, and so I was thinking about him all the way, you know, and I was talking to the sky about him, Michaela, and just sort of, and so I'm not afraid to see him up there. I'm not afraid to see him in the sky and I'm not afraid to talk to him. And it's beautiful when I do talk to him and it's beautiful when we all talk to the people we've lost. And so don't be afraid to see dead people. Geraldine mm -hmm. Brooks knows the way. Such a great quote. There's a <laughs> yeah. wonderful question from Jane that came early on. Are, is there, was there any idea you came up with that was just too outrageous that you just couldn't, you couldn't work it into the story? <laughs> oh, Jane, that's a great question. All the time, all the time I come up with ideas like that. Um, you know, especially in Boy Swallows Universe, like it was when I was going full tilt, the back second half of that and about the darkness where it goes. But there's a passage in this book and, and it really... Um, it really speaks to my love of those moments in storytelling and the DNA of storytelling. And I really do mean that sort of Homer type storytelling where the, the hero is tempted to give up the quest and, uh, and, and because it's just too hard. And, uh, and there were people coming out of the woodwork in my mind to tempt Molly to stop her quest. And uh, that's powerful to me anyway, that thread, because um, I, I don't mind it when people want to escape from themselves for a bit. And I, I'm very, I've got a real soft spot for drunks and drug addicts. And for that very reason, I get why people want to stop the quest. You know, sometimes it is just bloody too hard. And, you know, I don't, I don't say a word about anyone who finds that darkness too much to bear. And, uh, but uh, all through that book, there were just in, in the, the characters come in and provide that moment in all our shimmering skies are, are weird enough, but there were so many weirder ones, let me tell you. And uh, because that in truth, in truth, that, that forest is filled. It genuinely, it was back in the day. Those places were genuinely 1940s Australia, those outback places and those forests were filled with genuine people trying to make their escape. And, and I'm talking murderers, rapists, the worst kinds of scum and villainy, were out there and, and they were escaping from the police and they were trying to transform themselves. So what came of that Michaela was a, a sort of circus of, um, of incredible characters that uh, I had to hold back from and just filling that whole forest with the complete sort of wacky people. But um, yeah, there's so many things, um, you know, so many things I always have to rein myself in and go, Oh no, no, let's not, or, or, or let alone miracles that fall from the sky. Don't even get me started. You know, you have to keep it on a knife edge of believability. And so the things that do fall though, let me tell you, in case you're wondering, all of those things can fall. And that's what I made sure, you know, you know what I mean? I won't reveal what they are, but all of them can. And, and I was proud that I just went, no, okay. That is actually has been documented that can happen. So yeah, I just tried to keep with everything that can happen, but just amp it up a little bit and just turn it up a little touch, you know?
Yeah. We've got a few more we can get through. Yeah, great. A, a quick one. Are, are we? Are you planning on, do you have HarperCollins are planning on releasing an audiobook version of all our Shimmering Oh, stars? there's an amazing, um, oh, get this. Okay, so, so uh, 19, early 1990s. Now, Michaela, do you remember a show called The Colin Carpenter Show? Do you remember that? Kim Gingell, um, Comedy Company. Yes, I do. Do you remember that? Yes, he, I sort do. Of, so Comedy Company. Bloody company, funny. Right, yeah. funny guy. And, and okay, the straight man to Kim Gingell's funny guy in the Colin Carpenter show was an actor called Stig Wemmis, right? And he would set up the gags and Colin would hit him for six, right? And, uh, and my brothers and I, throughout all that time in the 80s and the early 90s, you know, that, that's, that show only ran for like two seasons. It was like a side spin-off from the comedy company. And, and my brothers and I loved that show because Colin Carpenter reminded us in truth of our old man. And, uh, but, but, um, but, Stig Wemmis we loved and we loved just the name Stig Wemmis and we loved his quirky character and uh and then come time to read the audiobook of Boy Swallows Universe I got a list of four names right of potential audiobook readers right okay and so I'm going to try and tell this really quick and so four names and I go oh my god one of those names third from the top Stig Wemmis and he's I a great this, narrator now isn't he brilliant narrator like amazing the guy won an award for his narration yeah. of Boy Swallows Universe so deservedly it was incredible and and I send that email to my brothers. I'm like, guess who's going to read the audio book for Boy Swallows Universe? Stig Wemmis. Okay, then cut to like 2020, early uh, this year, Michaela. I get a similar email. Hey, Trent, here's four names of people and, and sound bites of their kind of, it's like a, like a sound reel of how they might read the book. And they're reading beautiful passages. And all of them were amazing. But there was one who stood out, right? And, uh, and this girl, she's just so incredible. Ruby. And, uh, and, and I'm going, and that's all I see. It's just Ruby. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, um, and then I go, Oh, this is it. My wife and I listen to it and we tap on it. We go, that's amazing. And then unbelievably Michaela, I find out that she's Stig Wemmis's daughter. So, uh, so it's oh, no. Stig's, yeah, Stig's daughter's Fantastic. reading the, um, audio book for all our streaming guys and she smashes it out of the park. So, yeah, um, it's it's all out there, guys. On you know Belinda Audio, and um, yeah, and you know I think you can get it on Audible, and uh, yeah, so just absolutely look for it. And she's done the most amazing job. She's just beautiful. This actress to hit to to hear an actress say the lines of an actress like Greta or a young girl like Molly. It was just beautiful, Michaela. It's a thing in it in its and of itself. Like it's just a, it was such a treat. So I can't wait for you all to hear it. Yeah. I'm going to ask one or two more before we run out of time. Michelle says you write the absolute best kid characters. Would you ever <laughs> consider writing a book for kids? Oh, wow. That's a great, that's a great um, idea. You know, um, my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter and I, we are we're, like, we constantly, we're not, it's, we're not going to put it in the train or anything, but we, we laugh about our book that like we, we talk about it maybe once every three months or something we go, what about that book? Right. It's called, it's called lights out, right? Lights out. And, um, and it's pictures of kids across the world and they're saying lights out in different languages. And, and it's like a father and a daughter saying like lights out, you know, Kim Kimiko lights out, you know, African kid, uh, you know, lights out and, and all around the world, all these fathers and daughters having these interactions. And then, the, you know, the page is bright. And then, and then the next page is we see the kid sleeping and, lights out and it's called lights out yeah anyway that's my uh that's my that's my daughter and my uh kids book that's in the works yeah but uh we're not really progressing that far but it's there it's there also there's a book called ice cream at the zoo and uh it's based on my nephew darcy who's now like 18 but my wife and i once took darcy to taronga zoo and um and he spent the whole time walking around Taronga Zoo saying ice cream at the zoo and uh and so i pictured a, <laughs> I pictured a kid's book um this is a, I, mean, I think probably the question was more probably young adult book. Someone was probably suggesting, but, but if I'm talking full on kids book, ice cream at the zoo and it's a picture of a, a version of Darcy holding various chocolate paddle pop, golden gay time, ice creams in front of various exotic animals at Taronga Zoo. I love it. Um, look, there are a couple of questions. I realize we're just on the knock. I'm going to ask you one more. You've touched on it tonight already about, taking the rocks from inside you and just getting them out into the world. But Kate yeah. says, you know, what drives you to sit down every day and write? What drives you now that you've been doing it for, for as a journalist and now as an author for a number oh. of years? Thank you, Kate. It's a really, I mean, you're cutting to the heart of who I am and why I do what I do. I, I, 
And I've thought about this. I have thought about this. My wife and I talk about this all the time. It's like, what are you going to do with what you're given? Well, okay. It was one thing I could do at school, Michaela, and that was English, right? English. Shirley Adams, my, my high school English teacher would tell you so. And, and I just remember her just saying, stop being a dickhead, you know, and, and own <laughs> this thing that you're okay at, which is putting a couple of sentences together. And, and she's right. And I didn't honor that for so long. And, uh, but, um, but here's the thing I've started to realize that was the one gift that I had to process the other stuff that I would also be given, which is, which is some of the crazy stuff that might've happened in the eighties and nineties. So, okay. What if I don't put that through words? Like I, I was so lucky to become a journalist and be able to go into people's living rooms and, and ask them questions about their lives. Because each one of those times I did that, I was just processing my own baggage and my own stuff. And, and then I drive home and I think about that, that thing. I'm talking hours in someone's living room for them to tell me about life. And, and all the time they're talking to me, I'm just thinking about the moves that people in my life made and why they might've made them and, and why I still love them and, and, and why that person was worthy of my love or why, why that person isn't. And then I'd transcribe that story and sometimes I'd weep about it and I'd, you know, be a mess, but, um, but what a cathartic way to process your own baggage through words. And, and I, I truly believe if I, if I didn't have that ability, I'd be a, I'd be a drunk. I'd be, I'd be drinking straight bourbon right now. And I, you wouldn't, I would not be getting a chance to talk to wonderful people like you, Michaela, and listen to these amazing questions. And it's just a fact. I am, I'm certain of it. And so what do we do with what we've got? And you've got to, you've got to process that stuff in the best way you can. And some people do it in sport and triathlons and bloody running and whatever. I just happen to do it through words. And, um, and I think it, and I've started to realize that, I'm just kicked around by the universe and the universe said, Hey mate, keep doing this and um, you'll, you'll get by, you know? And, and I, I really like that. And I realize that now. And, and the more you do it, the less inclined you are to go down the other road, you know? And um, yeah, it's very powerful. Great mm. bloody question. Thank you. Great so questions. <laughs> we, we have run out of time. I wanted to say, I feel like this novel is really a love letter to stories and thank you for giving that gift to all of us. And thank you so much to everyone who was with us tonight for, for this better red than dead event. I know there are going to be heaps more events that you can check out on their website, but for now, you know, we can all kind of see each other a bit, but join me in thanking Trent Dalton. Oh uh, yeah. I'm going to put it on. Um, I'm going to put it on gallery view so I can see every, me Oh, too. look at you all. Me wow. Too. Oh, Rachel, Jen, Laura, Kelly, Anna, Kate, Mary, Henry, Colleen. Thank you so much. Michaela, you're an angel. Thank you so much for your beautiful questions. It pleasure. was such an honor. Such a pleasure. Good Lucy, evening, thanks everyone. for making it happen. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Whitney, Mary, MJ, Narelle, Anusha, Allison. V Vecchi, <laughs> Peter, Meg, Trudy, you guys are the best. Love you all. Thank you so much. Oh, hang on. There's more. There's, there's a whole there's other more, page. There's a whole other page. All right. I'll on. be stuck here forever. But look at you guys. Sally, Ali, <laughs> Christine, Ella. Uh, I'll see you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> really wonderful. We could have a great night, everyone. Stay well. Stay Thank safe. Thank you, we'll Michaela. You You're the best. Thanks, Those Trent. questions were incredible. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, Trent. Bye. Awesome. Great to see you. Bye, guys. Bye.